What's up, you guys? Welcome to Walk the Line. We're talking UFC Macau, a fight card that is headlined by two fighters that have really carved a name out in the game for themselves. Two top five bantamweight fighters, the former flyweight champion, Devison Figueredo, who's taken on Piotr Jan. Piotr Jan has had his setbacks against the top fighters in this division, but he's coming into this fight off of arguably the best performance of his career against uh, Yadong Song. That was an amazing performance by Piotr Jan. And remember, he's just 31 years old now, right? He's been fighting in the octagon for some time. People have turned their back on him a little bit at times. I could admit that I have been one of them. And when I say turn my back on him, I'm talking about as far as him making a run at, at getting that title once again. But after the performance that he just had against Song, you got to think that he's just hitting on all cylinders right now. And then Devison Figueredo has looked phenomenal since coming up in weight from the flyweight division. He's now 3-0 and up in the bantamweight division. And that quickly, he's ranked number five in this division. So I'm very excited for that fight. This card has a little bit of a pay-per-view hangover vibe to it overall. Let's be honest. I mean, the UFC 309 fight card, uh, at least I thought it was an amazing card on paper going into it, and I thought it really delivered. So th this one's going to be a little bit of a, a step back, but there's some exciting fights. I like the Carlos Olberg versus Volkan Ostemir fight as well. That fight has major implications for the future of the light heavyweight division, uh, a division that's looking for some fighters to, to make a run towards the top now. Uh, so so that, that's something you got to keep an eye on there. Other than that, you're going to have a lot of a lot of Asian fighters, a lot of Chinese fighters. Of course, we have the finales or the tournament finals of a lot of the road to UFC uh, tournaments that have been going on. We'll dive into those fights and I will look to make this video uh, very clean and crisp for you guys. I just want to say this. Uh, fortunately, I'm recording this after UFC 309 took place, which is not always uh, the scenario when I'm recording some of these episodes. And uh, it was another clean sweep for me. And listen, I'm not just saying this uh, to be one of those guys in the mic that's just uh, gloating about about the profits we've been bringing in but I, i'm honestly telling you guys right now the last six months have been the most profitable and successful uh, six month period in time uh, that i've ever had betting on mma since i've been deep into this uh, deep in this world bet, betting on mixed martial arts betting on the ufc it's been the best run that i've ever had so it, it feels good because guys you know it doesn't always go smoothly okay i've had my ups and downs but we do profit year to year, but this last six month run has been crazy and we've been hitting clean sweeps left and right. I want to give a special shout out to everyone that rides with me for my, my official my official plays. And if you guys want to work with me, just reach out to me. Shoot me an email, DM me on Instagram or Twitter. I got them scrolling below. Shoot me a message. Go follow me over there and I'll give you guys further details. And before we jump into the first fight, I just want to give a special shout out to my partners over at BetUS. No other sports books are giving out the type of deposit matches that you can get over at BetUS. Reach out to me. Let me give you my referral link. You sign up through that link. You're going to get a 150% match on your first three deposits. Uh, BetUS will take very good care of you. They got great lines all throughout the website. You could find everything you need to find uh, that you're looking to place a wager on. And if you guys reach out to me, you sign up through my link. I'm going to give you guys an additional gift as well. So just want to put that on the table for you guys. And with no further ado, let's jump into today's episode. <laughs> Kicking this thing off, we'll head over to the lightweight division where we have Hayasar Mahashata taking on Nicholas Mota. Both fighters are coming into this fight off a much needed victory. Essentially, both fighters were coming in to that last fight on a two fight losing skid. Although Mota got away with one. If you remember his fight with Trey Ogden, he was get, getting completely dominated. And Ogden was about two minutes away from getting that decision victory. Or you could even argue he was potentially going to cinch that sub up. He had him in a, a little sub there. And Mike Beltron, I believe it was Mike Beltron, if I remember that fight correctly, uh, decided to stop that fight when he did, which I, I have no, no idea what he was thinking in there. Because uh, obviously at the time, uh, Mota wasn't tapping and he wasn't out of it. So uh, the fight then gets turned into a no contest where Trey really got the bad end of the stick there. Uh, so just understand that he was coming in to that Nolan fight on a two fight losing skid. He was coming into that Nolan fight, having lost three of his last four with his only victory over a fighter in Cameron Van Camp, a uh, fighter that realistically is not even UFC caliber. So uh, it's been kind of tough for Mota. Luckily for him, Tom Nolan, who's actually proving to, to live up to some of that initial hype that he had coming off Dana White's contender series, made an atrocious mistake uh, running into a strike of Mota there. He got way, uh, way, way too over aggressive in that matchup. And you know if Mahashata does something like that, yeah, Mota can knock you out. Mota has above 
average power, I would say, or at the very least, I would say the main strength of Mota's game is his power. All right. He has nine knockouts out of his 14 victories. All right. If you want to try to avoid uh, one of his strengths, don't run in recklessly. Don't don't run into one of his strikes. You want to fight a measured approach. And Mota's there to be finished as well, right? He's been finishing every single one of his losses. He's been knocked out in four of, of his six losses and subbed in the other two. Okay, so he shows real vulnerabilities in there if you're looking to get a finish. And that's something to keep an eye on here too because Mahashate has shown to be vulnerable to, to being finished in his own right. I know uh, only one of his three uh, losses have come by way of knockout, knockout, but that was his last loss. And he took some serious damage uh, against Borishev when he when he was finished up there in the second round. So you can have some of those concerns uh, about his chin as well, especially because I would say he's a little bit uh, lower level defensively. Okay, defensively. Now, offensively, uh, he, he's pretty fine-tuned offensively. He's one of those rare fighters that, that's pretty tight with his guard, throws nice strikes, uh, but he kind of freezes up and falls, falls asleep at the wheel sometimes uh, with his stand-up, and, and it costs him. Okay, because even, even other fights prior... Uh, where he's looked good and he's gotten victories. We've seen him touched up a little bit. And if you take a look at the numbers, all right, he's been absorbing 5.76 uh, strikes per minute while only landing 3.9. Uh, Mota, on the other hand, landing 3.08 while absorbing 4.78. So both fighters uh, have a, a backwards number there, if you will, something that I never like to see when I'm back in a fighter, but uh, both of them have, have, the, have those backward numbers there. So uh, this should have the makings of being a fun fight. Uh, something to keep an eye on. You're going to have a lot of Chinese fighters uh, on this fight card, fight taking place in China. You could point that out and say that there could be an advantage for those fighters as those fights go to the judges' scorecards. I'm not seeing this fight making it to the final bell. I think we're going to see a knockout here. Okay, that, that's my gut instinct. Mota brings it. I, I'm favoring Mahashate to get a knockout here, maybe in the second round. I think he can counter uh, Mota. As, as Moda is getting a little aggressive, maybe he gets a little frustrated as Mahashate is the more polished striker overall. Also note, uh, Mahashate will be a little bit more rangy and long. So uh, he's also shown to fight uh, at range and uses good footwork, footwork at times. I would like to see him use that type of tactic where I think he could have a lot of success, get Moda frustrated in there and encounter him with some strikes. And another key factor I want to bring up is the fact that Mahashate is still only 24 years old. So there's a lot of room for growth. Remember, uh, he came in to that Dana White's contender series very young at the time. I think he was only 21 years old. Uh, he he defeated Achilles uh, Esther Madura, who, who's a fighter who bounced back with the victory after the fight. He hasn't been active in the fight game, but he was the only fighter to have ever defeated him. Followed that up with a knockout victory over Steve Garcia, who's been on absolute fire. We talked about the two-fight losing skid where he was cracked by Slava. Just also note that Rafa Garcia had a lot of success against him using his wrestling, controlling him on the mat for about six minutes in that fight. Really frustrated Mahashate there. I don't know if Mota has the grappling skills to, to really do that. I think both these fighters are kind of limited with their grappling, and I think this is a fight that's probably going to be taking place on the feet for the vast majority before someone probably lands a big shot that shakes things up. If it goes to the judges' scorecards, I think it favors Mahashate also in a major way, having that hometown edge, being the cleaner striker uh, but with his volume and all that. I just think that he, he'll get the, the nod there. All right, now on BetUS, he opened up as a minus 210. He's now a minus 200. And I wouldn't be surprised if this line continued to dip down because it's kind of a, a wide line, if you ask me. I think it should be a little closer. I like Mahashata to win the fight, but I have him capped more around like a minus 170 or so. So if you're looking to play him, I think that this is a line you might want to sit back on. And then if you're uh, if you're lucky there, it'll continue to, to come down. You can get better value. But I would caution you guys to be targeting him uh, anywhere above minus 200 at the very least. Now, that's that's kind of wide for, for my liking, but give me my shot there to get that knockout. And the bantamweight division representing China, we have Long Shao taking on the Vietnamese Quang Li. A lot of you guys are familiar with Li based upon his last fight where he took that on short notice against a higher level fighter, right? A fighter that has already proven himself in the UFC and Chris Gutierrez. Gutierrez was a huge favorite. I'm sure some of you guys had Gut Gutierrez uh, mixed in some parlays and Lee had you guys on the edge of your seats as that fight played out a little bit closer than a lot of us thought that it was uh, going to play out, especially based off where the line was. If you really didn't dive into the fight, you, you thought that Gutierrez would just run through him in that fight. Lee had some success with his grappling, uh, had Gutierrez is back for a while, I believe in the second round. And uh, he's shown to be a decent grappler, but he's also shown to develop with his striking the fight that he had prior uh, to making that UFC debut uh, was against Thang, 
Uh, took place at LFA 181. He had a nasty finish on him in the first round, hit him with that left hook. And even before that final knockout sequence, he was landing some, some decent strikes at range. Okay, so he's showing some development there. A lot of us look at him as more of a grappling-based fighter, but I've also seen him lacking a little bit defensively with his grappling. Uh, the Sal Guerrero fight was a fight that played out uh, pretty close, went to a split decision, and, and he had some, some issues there at times. So just keep an eye on that. Now, when it comes to Long Shao, I believe he has the higher ceiling especially taking into consideration he's just 26 years old, already has 35 professional fights. He came up short on Dana White's contender series against Christian Quinoas. That was a fight that he showed to be lacking defensively uh, on the feet. He did take some damage there, came up short in those, those striking sequences. Uh, but after taking that loss, uh, went on a nice little four-fight winning streak, had success on the road to UFC, came into his UFC debut fight against Chang Ho Lee. I targeted him. Uh, as an official play in that fight. I thought that he won that fight. You could pull up the media scorecards. Uh, it's about split. I mean, so it really shows that it was a close fight. You, it really could have went either way, but I I seriously thought that he should have won that fight. You know, I'm honest with myself. When, when I'm breaking down these fights round to round, I'm like, hey, you know what? I'm probably not going to get the nod here. I'm, I I really had him winning two of the three rounds in that fight, although I think it was like it came down to the third round and it did play out closely. I liked the heart that he showed. He, he can mix it, mix it up on the feet. Uh, but he really will push the pace with his grappling. He'll, he'll push you against the cage. He'll try to mix in takedowns. And with him just being 26 years old, I think there's a lot of room for growth. And uh, there, there's a great possibility that he comes out to this fight uh, looking to have taken a, a real leap in his skill set. Okay. Uh, he's the larger fighter here. When you're breaking down tape, it seems like Lee is longer than him. But you, you take a look at the numbers here, at least what I got. And, and Sh uh, Long Shao is a fighter that's going to have about a one inch reach advantage. He's about an inch taller, and uh, I thought that was a little surprising. So I'm, I'm curious to see how they look as they face off at, at the stare downs. Uh, but Long Shao, if this fight goes to the judges' scorecards, we should see a lean towards his way. And I kind of favor this fight to go to the judges' scorecards. He's a tough dude. I, I can see him being the aggressor, and I think that this is a fight that he can edge out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna side with Long Shao to win a decision here, and uh, to just being a hard nosed fighter, marching forward, mixing it up, and I, I think that he may even have some success with his grappling. A lot of us were talking about the grappling of Lee, but don't be surprised if it's Long Shao that gets the better of some of those situations, okay? Uh, they, they may play out closely, but I'll lean towards his way. Uh, the one thing I will say is that he pushes a crazy pace in his fights consistently. If you pull up all of his fights, he really comes at the gates blazing. And I have seen him slow down a little bit, but with the pace that he pushes, he drags his opponents in, into that same type of situation. So a lot of times you see his opponents breathing very heavily too, um, but but I'm really curious to see how the third round is going to play out if it goes there. And I do expect it to, to make it there. And I think that we could even see strides in Long Shao's uh, cardio game as well. Just just everything. He's going to mature as a fighter um, physically and, and all that. And, and I'd rather be on his side here. I think that's the smarter route, especially when you take a look at the betting line. This is a fight that, that the, the line is very close. It opened up as uh, with Long Shao being a minus 115 uh, at exactly pick him odds. And now there's a slight lean coming his way as he's a minus 122. I think. That's the safer side to be on. I, I like that side better. Give me Long Shao to win a decision. So the flyweight division gets two more young stud prospects added to it. Loner, Kavanaugh, uh, he's the, the A side here, if you ask me. I mean, I'm very pleased at what I've been seeing from him. I had an official play in him in that Dana White's Contender Series fight where he fought a very talented flyweight prospect in Ann Ho. That's another fighter that will eventually work his way into the UFC's flyweight division. I, I believe so. Uh, now he's taking on Jose Ochoa. Jose Ochoa, uh, who is now training with, with Shootbox, uh, the Peruvian fighter, Jose Ochoa, he shows to have some real potential too. Both these fighters undefeated, both fighters 7-0. and uh, I want to kick this off by talking about Kavanaugh for a second because at just 25 years old, I think that this is a fighter that has real, real potential to make a run in this division. His striking is phenomenal. Uh, the way he moves in there, of course, after he had that, that knockout over Anjo, hit him with the nice right. I think it was like a straight right. After that, he's doing flips in there. He's looking like a video game character. He also shows to have really been improving with his grappling. I think he's a complete fighter. And at the very least, he's going to prove to be a very complete fighter in the next couple of years. So you keep an eye on him. Okay, he's going to be coming into this fight as, as a big favorite based on that performance. But you have to understand that the Peruvian Ochoa is a very dangerous fighter. And he's 7-0. and I say he's 7-0, and but he's essentially 8-0, and right? He has that one no contest. If you pull that fight up, he was in route to not only winning that fight, but getting a knockout. He was landing some nasty knees in the clinch. He got so reckless in there just looking for that finish that he threw a knee up the middle and it landed flush on the cup. 
and uh, the opposition wanted nothing to do with continuing uh, to, to fight Ochoa. And, and it was Ruiz. I believe that was the Ruiz fight. Uh, so, so you could really say he's 8-0 with seven knockouts and one submission victory. Okay, he's going to come out like a bat out of hell. He's going to be looking for a finish. I have no doubt about that. The way that he fights and now even specifically getting in that work over at Shootbox, he's going to be more aggressive. He's going to be uh, as aggressive as ever. So that's a little bit of uh, the, the wild factor here because even though Kavanaugh is so polished, he's so technical and should be a step ahead, if this fight has the crazy pace that I think that it will have, you never know, okay? You never know. It just takes one shot. And nowadays, you know, we, we used to look at the flyweight division as a division where, oh, you don't see as many finishes. It's a lower lower weight class and, and they don't carry as much power in the, in the strikes. But th these, these young flyweights are so talented and they're so sharp with their striking. It only takes one to land on the chin and you never know, okay? So I just want to say that all in all, I do like Kavanaugh. To get the job done here, I think that he's a fighter that has a much higher ceiling. And this is a fighter that I think uh, we could be talking about uh, making a run. I mean, you guys might go crazy here. This is a fighter that could make his run to fight for the title in the next three years or so. You know what I mean? I mean, that's the type of potential we're talking about. And that's not to say that Ochoa doesn't have that type of potential as well, but I need to see more from him. There's just, there, there's an it factor with Kavanaugh. There's a real it factor with him. And I will pick Loner Kavanaugh to win this fight. I mean, I could see him getting the knockout here as well. I think that Ochoa may be a little bit reckless in there looking for his own finish, and I could see Kavanaugh countering him. Uh, but I could also even see Kavanaugh going to the grappling. Maybe he proves to just be the more complete fighter. No matter how you spin it, you got to be on the Kavanaugh side, although Ochoa does show to have his own promise. Uh, but what we're talking about here is a very high betting line uh, on Kavanaugh. Right now, he's around a 4-1 to one favorite. Okay, I mean, I don't think you could do anything with that. I, I really don't, especially... The fact that both these fighters have a limited amount of pro fights, there's just there's a lot of moving parts going into this fight. So there's a lot of unknowns. Okay, we we don't have lo a long track record on either of these fighters fighting in the octagon with the bright lights on them. Ochoa may be he he may show to be the fighter that rises to the occasion in the octagon on a big scene. I'll, even though Kavanaugh has already shown to have ice in his blood on Dana White's Contender Series, but the point I'm getting to is just you can't be chalking up minus 400, in my opinion. You, you just really can't. This is a fight that I'm personally sitting back, enjoying, watching from a from a, a fan's perspective, just seeing who's going to make a name for themselves and uh, st start to be another fighter that we talk about in this flyweight division. And I'm kind of hoping it's Kavanaugh, like I said, because I think he has the higher ceiling. But uh, the value, in my opinion, it, it just has to be on Ochoa, which you can grab, you know, as high as like almost a plus 300 right now, three to one odds. I don't know, man. He's getting in that work at shoot box. Uh, but give me Kavanaugh to win. I'm going to say he wins the decision. And I'm going to say that he changes levels. He mixes things up and he really showcases the growth of his overall game. In the flyweight division, we have Carlos Hernandez taking on Yam Jergal Tumendembaral. How do you like that pronunciation there? Uh, for all you guys that are always attacking me in the comments section. Uh, that's a tough one. It literally looks like someone took their fist and just smashed the keyboard and hit a bunch of random letters together. Uh, Tumen Dembaral is a fighter that was uh, supposed to have made his UFC debut against a fighter that I'm very high on in Andre Lima, a fighter that's coming off a victory over Felipe Dos Santos. And I went back and forth with a lot of you guys uh, on that pick there. Of course, Andre Lima actually used his grappling uh, to, to pretty much take control of that fight, uh, finished on top there in the third round. I think Andre Lima is still one of the more higher level strikers in this division. I know I went back and forth with some of you guys there too. I think Lima is a good fighter. So just wanted to kind of bring shed some light on him, but I think that Andre Lima really would have been a, a, a big step up in competition uh, for Nyam Jurgal, and maybe lucky for him that fight didn't take place. I have Carlos Hernandez as a step down in competition compared to Lima, but I still think that Carlos Hernandez is a step up in competition compared to anything that Nyam Jurgal has faced thus far. Okay, uh, he's, a, he's a very exciting fighter. I will give him that. You, you can pull up his highlight reel and pull up some of his fights on YouTube. Uh, he's been putting in some work over on the road to UFC. Uh, he has fights where he's went out there and got has gotten knockouts within seconds. He has that seven uh, second knockout over uh, Watanabe, and this is a fighter that shows potential uh, to to an extent, right? Uh, he's a fighter that shows potential to maybe be one of those fighters that delivers uh, from an entertainment standpoint. But as of right now, he's just twenty six. But as of right now, I see him lacking very much technically uh, and in multiple aspects of his game. Right? He has. The majority of his victories via sub, but actually when you watch him on tape, he's a fighter that is very willing to trade on the feet. I mean, he's a fighter that really looks to knock you out. 
and has had a couple of knockouts as recently. We talked about the, uh, those two knockouts that he's had. But uh, with his grappling, even when he's gotten the fight down to the mat, I've seen him make mistakes. I've seen him reversed. And I think that Carlos Hernandez is just a much more base fighter. His boxing has really been coming around. He has a lot more experience against higher level fighters. Uh, his grappling and his wrestling is good. I could see him kind of settling in a little bit more in those grappling scenarios and settling in on top. Okay. And I like the strength of ske schedule that he's had as of recently. Uh, he's coming off two losses in a row uh, against two of the, the highest level Japanese prospects in the game in uh, Rea uh, Tsura and Tatsuro Taira. Okay, he lost both of those fights, went to a decision in that last one, uh, but but he has some notable victories too. And, and I'll also just note, he has a, a submission loss against Alan Nascimento. That's another fighter that I'm very high on in this division. He, he's huge in there. Uh, he, he's a real talent down on the mat. Uh, but it, but in the mix of, of those losses, he's went out there and got victories over fighters like Denise Bondar, uh, Victor Altamirano, Daniel Barrez. And although... The Alto Moreno and Barrez fights were both very close, and you could have argued he lost both of them. They were very competitive fights, and Daniel Perez is a fighter that we, we all now know. I mean, not, not to toot my own horn, I was on him in that last spot, but he's a fighter that has shown promise, and I think that he's a, he's a real talent. So even to have kept it competitive with a fighter like Perez, I think that that kind of shows you where he's at. And he's came so far since that fight, okay? I mean, he's really looking... Uh, to to be the best version that we've ever seen from Hernandez, and I think that he's just more polished here. He's gonna be more ready for this this fight than uh, Nyam Jergal will be, and uh, we'll see eventually if he can continue to sharpen up his skill set and settle down, settle himself in the UFC. But I'm not so sure. All right, he has the look; he's wild, and he has this whole look going for himself, and he has an exciting style. But technically, I just don't see it. I'm gonna go with the the safer pick here on Carlos Hernandez, who's uh, he's a pretty refined fighter. For a 31-year-old fighter that just has 13 pro fights, he's he's pretty refined. And uh, he has a very uh, professional t type of attack to himself. And he's well-rounded. And uh, even though he has no knockouts, like I said, keep an eye on the striking too. Because he's 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 coming around there, right? He's shown some flashes on the feet with his boxing as of recently. He obviously doesn't have a lot of pop. But if, if Yom, Yom uh, Jergal gets a little overzealous in there if he's reckless you never know if uh, Hernandez can catch him with like a, a check hook or something like that but all in all I like Carlos Hernandez to get the job done here he opened up as a minus 145 on bet us and that line is getting steamed quite a bit he's now very rapidly a minus 195 he's almost a two to one favorite here um, the, the line's getting a little out of hand in my opinion obviously you wanted to be in on it early but I understand why that line's coming coming down like that uh, or coming up um, I, I understand exactly why that, that line movement's happening. Hernandez is the fighter that's proven more and seems to, to be coming around. I like the level of competition he's been in there with, and he's very hungry. He knows he has to get a W here. It's do or die for him. Okay. He has his back up against the wall. Uh, cannot, he cannot lose this fight. If he loses this fight, he'll be what? One in one in four, uh, pull it up real quick. I and mean, if he loses this fight, he's probably, he could be cut by the UFC. He'll be on a three fight losing skid and would have lost four of his last five fights that's an issue so i like a hungry hernandez to bounce back to, to the the win column there and i'll say that he wins a decision i'm going to favor this fight making it to the final bell uh, the the ufc newcomer has shown to be pretty tough thus far he's never lost so obviously he's never been finished but it seems to be pretty tough and durable and hernandez hasn't shown to have the most pop in his hands give me a decision and the road to ufc's a straw weight tournament championship we have fang shao khan taking on Shi Ming. Fang is going to be one of the bigger favorites on this card. She's roughly a three to one favorite. She comes into this fight uh, as the much larger fighter too. You take a look, she has a five inch height advantage, if you will. Uh, she's going to have a six inch reach advantage. And, and one thing that I like for her here is, is she's a reliable fighter in the sense that she's going to hunt for, for those single legs and she's going to be looking to, uh, to ankle pick you like Tony Ferguson. She really presses with her takedowns. And I've seen Shi Meng struggle a little bit. Uh, and uh, with her grappling, even in some of the fights where she's had success early in the fights, uh, she's then started to, to fall short with her grappling later in some of those rounds. I think there is a path to victory uh, for, for Fang there. Uh, but even besides that, I have Fang Shao Kahn as the more uh, complete fighter. Even on the feet, she can get the better of the stand-up. She has that massive six-inch uh, reach advantage, and she's decently technical. Uh, I mean, I don't want to sit here on the mic and, and just... Uh, start saying to you guys what, what, what everyone thinks you're going to hear. Oh, this is an extremely low level fight. I think you guys kind of gather that to an extent, but uh, let's not criticize them that much. Let's see how they perform on the night. Um, Feng Shao Kahn is a fighter who's still very young. 
Uh, I believe she's, what, 22 years old. So there's a lot of room for growth. Uh, you know, yes, she's a fighter that once upon a time took a submission loss to uh, Liang Na, which is not a good look. If you if you guys know, uh, as I like to call her, Na Liang, Liang Na. She's a fighter that uh, is kind of a, a little bit of, of a running joke in the UFC's uh women's strawweight division just for the way that she fights she comes out like a bat out of hell but completely breaks down uh but but you know even though we poke fun at her she can be a little bit dangerous at times early on especially when you're just a 19 year old girl so that was a learning experience for her back then uh, she she barely had any pro experience and, and uh, compared to those days she's on a nice little winning streak right now and i think that she should be the fighter that gets her hand raised at the end of the day she should win this this bracket and um you know i, I would be kind of surprised if if she ming went out here and did enough with her stand up or got the better of the grappling exchanges or got the better of any of those, those wrestling exchanges. Um, even if she Ming did have success early on in the fight, I still wouldn't even rely on her to continue that for 15 minutes. I think that this fight makes it to the final bell. Uh, I really do. And I think that this is a fight that uh, there's a reason why Feng Shao, Shao Ken is a massive favorite. All right. I mean, I know you can kind of sit here and say, Oh, do I want to cough up three to one odds on a fight like this where you really can't trust either fighter? I mean, I'm more pointing towards the side that I think there's a pretty solid reason she's a three to one favorite and we'll keep an eye on that line. I wouldn't even be surprised if that line creeps up a little bit more. So maybe we see these two women uh, facing off or we see them on the scales. We see that size advantage. People dive into the tape a little bit more and see that uh, Feng Xiao Kahn is the more uh, complete fighter that has uh, more to offer, especially with her age too. You're going to see a step up in in uh, in her her skill set, whereas when it comes to Shi uh, Meng, not that she's a a completely finished product, but she's thirty years old and uh, she she's she's kind of already proven to be what she's probably going to be. I mean, you take a look at the, the amount of pro experience that she has; she already has twenty one pro fights. I think that's another sign that points towards uh, Fang there, in my opinion. And I will have her winning in decision. So normally, I'm always raving about all this new young talent making its way into the UFC's flyweight division. And typically when we have an undefeated prospect that's coming into the division, I, I've been very high on those kind of fighters, like some of the earlier ones we talked about. I'm going to cut to the chase. That's not really the case uh, when it comes to this fight here. We have uh, Kiru Sohota taking on Dong Hoon Choi. This is for the, the road to UFC's flyweight uh, tournament winner. And I'm not extremely high on either of these fighters. Uh, Choi, first and foremost, he went to a split decision in both of his fights on the road to UFC, and you could argue that he lost uh, possibly both of them, okay? He looks decently technical on the feet, like when you're watching him, you could tell he knows what he's doing, but he he just doesn't really have it, okay? He doesn't really have a lot of confidence in what, he, what he's doing out there, even though he looks like he knows what he's doing and he's moving well, but I, I just don't know. And I don't believe him to be a UFC caliber fighter. On the other hand, uh, Kiru Sohota is very long for this division. He's five foot ten with the seventy three inch wingspan, and he's shown some flashes. But when you take into consideration the level of talent that he's fighting against, you know he he's fought some of the weaker fighters in that that tournament. Okay, and he also did go to a split decision in his first fight. Um, he had a victory over Raul Pinellas and and the final one there, but. You know, I, I do like the length that that he possesses, and I've seen him show some flashes in some of his earlier fights too. I've seen him land a knockout here and there, but uh, but when you're watching him move, I don't know. I just feel like if you threw him in there with like legitimate UFC flyweight fighters, I think they would wreak havoc on him. So uh, you know, I, not to be a Debbie Downer here, but these are two lower level fighters. We'll see if they could put it together. I mean, uh, Choi is just 25 years old, so he does have some time. Um, I think that this is a fight that. It could play out to be somewhat entertaining, even though it's lower level. And overall, I do I do feel a little bit more confident in Choi just based on the fact that he, he moves better in there. He's a little bit more technical with his striking, and I think that he can kind of close the distance with his footwork, land some cleaner strikes. Uh, but if he does get caught up fighting from the outside, it could be Sahota's fight. Um, I'm going to side with Choi. I won't go too much longer on this fight. I'm going to say that Choi wins a decision. And uh, yeah, this fight's not really on the, the top of my list as far as fights that I'm anticipating. Choi opened up as a minus 155. That line has came down. The line probably should be closer because who, who really knows how this is going to play out. And Choi's, I, I believe it was his last fight where he came back and, and uh, he did uh, take the fight over. He took some damage in the first round. He's went through some adversity uh, in some of his fights. He was bloodied up pretty bad there in the first round against 
Uh, I believe it was his last fight. Yeah, it was uh, Engdad Abisht, which was a fight that went to a split decision. He was bloodied up. Uh, I guess you can give him some credit for, for pushing through that adversity there, but he also shows to have some defensive flaws. I've seen Sahota hit dudes right, right around the side of the head, crack them over the ear and, and hurt them and knock them out. I mean, I don't know if he can maybe pull something like that off. Uh, I, I was... I almost want to go with Sohota to win the fight because I want to throw a dog towards your guys' way, but but I want to be honest and, and ground myself with, with my pick here because I do believe that Choi is just a little bit more technical and uh, Sohota suffers a little bit from, you know, I like to throw these syndromes out there. I mean, this is a guy, uh, a little bit of, of giraffe syndrome for this division, right? You like the length, but I mean, he's out there. He looks like he's on wobbly stilts the way he's moving. And I like the fact that Choi is grounded and he's moving a little bit more athletically. But again, not a lot of confidence in the pick. I will side with Choi. I think that's the way I want to go, especially as this line is coming closer, uh, as it's closing to be a little bit closer. It's one thing if you're, you're siding with Choi at 155. I don't like the value there at all, as it edges to be a, a closer line. I think the value's on Choi, even at like minus 130. Um, he, he should be the favorite. All right, guys, one more road to UFC tournament finale, and then we'll work our way up to the main card. We have Su Young Yu taking on Balgen Genusali. Su Young Yu, he stands out to me a little bit in this matchup. Uh, specifically based off the grappling skills that he possesses. I, I like his jujitsu. Uh, I like the fact that he is not hesitant at all uh, as far as getting the fight down to the mat, or at least as far as him looking to get the fight down to the mat. You could expect him to have a very uh, aggressive attack, uh, shooting for singles and just doing whatever he can do to get this fight down to the mat. And I like his scrambling ability back there. He takes the back pretty well. I think that he will have the better jujitsu. Uh, if he gets stuck playing around on the feet, he... Could run into some issues for sure because his striking is low level. And Jenna Suli is, is a pretty big fighter for this division. He's definitely going to have uh, a solid uh, range and uh, reach advantage here. He's about three inches taller. He'll have about a five and a half inch reach advantage. His striking is low level, but it's probably what he does best. Uh, in some fights that I've watched of his where he's had success, you know, he's kind of he's fainting and, and just kind of peppering the opposition up with some strikes. Again, it's not really overwhelming uh it's it's not too, uh really th that Im imposing i mean look 18 victories uh, he's had and he's only had four knockouts okay so this isn't a fighter that's going out there and getting you uh getting the job done he's not finishing you there so uh maybe he could he could sneak out a decision now if the fight if the fight does spend a significant amount on 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 the feet he probably will have that edge when it goes to the judges scorecards uh but all in all, I still have to back the Korean here just based off the fact that I, I do like his grappling and I do like what I've seen from him there. And I think that he will get this fight down to the mat uh, a good amount of times and just enough to, to solidify rounds. And we'll see if he can maybe pull off a sub. Uh, he has five submission victories out of his 13 victories. Uh, on the other hand, we we also have seen Balgan submitted before. Um, you know, I, I'm going to go with the Korean to get the job done. I'm going to say... That Su Young Yu, Su Young Yo, I could say he gets a decision victory. I almost want to say he pulls off a sub. It's been a while since he's had a submission victory, but he does show to have some pretty solid skills down there. Um, I'm going to say he he wins a decision. I'm going to say he has a good amount of control time, and I will say he actually has a decision. But let's work our way up to the main card. Oh, well, real quick, let's talk about the line. Let me get you in the line real quick. Uh, a very similar line to the last fight we talked about. Young is a minus 145 favorite, and uh, you could be pushing it even with as low as that line is. This is a fight that maybe should be capped a little bit closer to even. Uh, you, you like maybe a slight lean towards Young's way, but minus 145, I don't know if we're talking about value. I think this is a, a fight that could play out closer than some of the other ones that we talked about. There could be a lean uh, the other way if it goes to the judges' scorecards, if it plays out relatively close. This isn't really a target of mine and uh let's get up to that main card let's go talk some main card action now hey guys real quick just want to give you a special thank you for coming by and checking my video out i'll make this quick but if you could why don't you go smash that like button for your boy subscribe to the channel i was checking my my analytics on my video half of you guys are not even subscribed to the channel what's up with that hit that subscribe button i got a lot going on here and uh if you guys can help support my, my cause and my movement just by hitting that like button and subscribe button it'll help me take this channel to another level go follow me on my social media it's scrolling below as well thank you guys so much back to the show in the light heavyweight division we have Zhang Mingyang taking on Ozzy Diaz uh, Zhang had a hell of a UFC debut if you guys remember that fight he had with Brendanson Ribeiro that was a fight where uh, we were all speculating we were going to see a knockout one way or another uh, and this is a similar fight too where both fighters are either knocking you out uh, or, or they're also being finished, right? This is that type of matchup. Ozzy Diaz 
brings in that that same type of uh, style uh, compared to Zhang and Brendan Ribeiro. Now, when Zhang faced off with Brendan Ribeiro, if you guys remember, it was a, a phenomenal knockout. And there was a little bit of, I wouldn't say controversy, but it was funny how it happened. Um, Brendan Ribeiro kind of poked Zhang in the eye and uh, Zhang was pointing at pointing to the ref, pointing to Beltran, letting him know he got poked in the eye. And Beltran's like, fight on. And as soon as he said fight on, Brendan Ribeiro uh, looked to close the distance and, and looked to be on the attack. And we saw Zhang hit him with that beautiful uh, counter combination. His boxing is is pretty legit for a 26 year old fighter uh, who's just starting to make a name for himself in the octagon. Right. Well, we'll see how far he could push it. I think that he's a fighter that shows potential and could hang around in the UFC. I think that he uh, may well. Uh, proved to be a UFC caliber fighter. Uh, he definitely has some exciting skills to him, but we'll, we'll see if he can put it all together and be a formidable opponent and hold on to a roster spot throughout the years. Um, when it comes to Ozzy Diaz, we saw him fall short on Dana White's contender series. Uh, he got knocked out by Joe Pfeiffer, uh, but who isn't Joe Pfeiffer knocking out? I mean, if your name ain't Jack Romanson, somehow you just uh, eat, eat everything but the kitchen sink and somehow walk through it, you're getting knocked out if you're facing Joseph Pfeiffer. Um, so you, you could almost even give him credit for making it to the second round there. After that, he bounced back with two knockout victories uh, in his own right. But, uh, you know, if you take a look at the Chuck Campbell fight, that was a fight where he went through a lot of adversity over at the, over in the LFA. He got dropped in that fight. Uh, did Ozzy. Ozzy got dropped in that fight. He was hurt. He showed his toughness. He got back up to his feet. He eventually got his own knockout, which is a, with only a second left in that first round. Followed that up with a knockout victory over a Bavon Lewis, who is also a Dana White's Contender Series alumni. So yeah, Ozzy Diaz is tough, and he will look to uh, run through damage and, and try to break you down. But I, I see a lot of holes in his game. And in this weight class, it, it's just risky, especially when you're fighting a fighter like Zhang, who's shown that he could put you out. I mean, 11 knockout victories out of his 17 wins. Yes, a lot of them have been over lower level fighters, but he kind of looks the part. He, he moves pretty well in there. Okay, I mean, he's pretty athletic and he's nimble for his size and for this weight class. And I see him landing on Ozzy Diaz. I got to side with, with Zhang Mingyang to get the job done. And I, I'm going to pick him to get a knockout uh, victory. You take a look at Ozzy Diaz's two losses that he's had. Both were via knockout loss. So, I mean, he's shown that, uh, I mean, he's willing to go out on his shield, like I said. And I, that's how I kind of see this fight going. Um, just also note, Zhang has been finished quite a bit in his losses. He's been knocked out three times in his own right. He's also been subbed. I wouldn't be surprised if Ozzy Diaz maybe goes through some initial adversity and then ends up getting his own knockout. That's the type of fighter that he is. I'm looking at unders in this fight, like under one and a half. I'm looking at uh, if you want to target a specific method of victory, no matter who you like, I think that they're going to get a knockout. I think it's going to have a high pace to it and someone's going to get hit with the big shot and, and they're going to they're going to get put out. And uh, I just feel more confident that that knockout uh, victor is going to be Zhang Mingyang. And we'll take a look at the betting line where he is. Yeah, he's actually... A pretty big favorite here. He opened as a minus 325, and he's now a minus 300. So you're get, looking at three to one odds if you want to take him there. That's a little risky, in my opinion, in this light heavyweight division where you got two big boys throwing down, and either man may get clipped with the shot. We don't have a large sample size also. Uh, as far as Jean goes, he has that one UFC debut victory, but uh, you never know. That fight could have easily went the other way if it would have played a little bit longer. It was one of those types of fights where either man was going to take that shot. This is one of those fights where either man could potentially take that shot. Even though Zhang's moving better, coughing up three to one is a little bit of a reach as far as I'm concerned. I, I, I got to say, the value is on Diaz. And that's simply, we're talking just the betting line. The value is on him. When you're getting as high as a plus 265 line next to his name, you know, I, I want to be clear. I'm not saying I favor Ozzy Diaz and I think Ozzy Diaz is going to go out here and take this fight, but that, that's a steep line. And Ozzy Diaz is tough. But all in all, He's lacking defensively, and Zhang's moves pretty well. I think he gets that knockout. We'll stay put in the light heavyweight division. This is going to be my second most anticipated fight of the event, of course, behind the main event. Uh, we got top 10 ranked action taking place, and I do believe there's some major implications for the future of this division. Vulcan, o Vulcan Ostemir taking on Carlos Olberg. Uh, real quick, just to put things into perspective of where we're at in the top 15, I believe that Magabedek Alive has to be next for Alex Pajeda. You guys know how I feel about that. Besides that, though, uh, you take a look at some of the fighters that are ranked above uh, both these men. Uh, Khalil Roundtree just lost uh, his attempt at fighting for the belt, so uh, he's a little bit on the back burner. I think that the winner of this fight will, will pass him up. Uh, Alexander Rakic is a fighter that uh, I'm surprised that he's even ranked as high as he is right now. 
Uh, so, so I think they could surpass him. And then you're looking at fighters that, that are coming in uh, to their next bouts, uh, you know, coming off losses, although high level losses, but fighters like Yuri Prohaska, Jamal Hill, the former champ, Jan Bukovic. I mean, if you're looking for some new blood in this division, of course, you have Azamat uh, Mirzakhanov, uh, Bogdan Guskov, a little bit of a reach, but he's a fighter that we'll see what he could do. But I think realistically, you're looking at Nikita Krylov and the winner of this fight. And I know Volkan o Ostemir is not necessarily uh, a fighter that's making a new run in this division. He's a fighter that fought for the belt back in the day against DC, but he's kind of like a, a, a new version of himself, if you will, right? He's not coming into this fight on a two fight winning streak, knocked out Johnny Walker, submitted Bogdan Guskov, who then Guskov uh, has had some success since that fight. So the stock goes up in that victory there. Uh, the only losses he's had as of recently are very high level losses. Uh, took a loss to Nikita Krylov, Magomed Nikolaev, uh, Yuri Prohaska. I think that Vulcan is a very underrated fighter. His striking is is very technical. He's very tough. He'll march forward. He'll land big shots on you. His grappling has came a long way. And that's something you got to keep an eye on in this matchup. Potentially, uh, he, he can look to mix things up in, in a fight that plays out uh, in a grueling manner. And he could change levels and maybe have some success there. Or we've also seen if, Carl, if you drag Carlos Olberg into one of those types of affairs... Uh, you can potentially crack him with a shot, hurt him as well. We, if you remember, uh, his last loss in the UFC was against Kennedy uh, and Shekowu, and that was a fight where uh, the, the pace really started to, to raise, and he got cracked with some shots in the clinch. It got ugly, and he broke down. But since that loss, I mean, he's been on absolute fire. Now, you could say his resume is uh, a little bit inflated, but I don't know. At the same time, I think that if you really dive into some of these victories, they're not as bad as you think. Uh, Ihor Pateria... Yeah, he's not horrible. Nikolai Negamariano's a fighter that's dissipated from the fight game, but he showed to have some skills. Da Unjong, you got to like the knockout victory he just had on Alonzo Menafield within just 12 seconds. I mean, he's surging as a fighter, and that's important for him because he's 34 years old. The time is now. I think that Carlos Olberg, even though both these fighters are high-level strikers, I like the striking of Olberg's uh, more so. I think that he's a little bit more quick twitch and a little bit uh, more speedy with his delivery, and I can see him being a little bit quicker to the punch. Um, you know, we, we've seen Vulcan knocked out before, right? In those types of fights where he's going to war, we've seen him knocked out. Uh, if, you, if you remember what um, what Prohaska did to him, I know it wasn't a typical type of strike, but what about what Prohaska uh, did to him with that? Uh, was it the spinning elbow, right? No, it was overhand right, but he hit him with a bunch of wild stuff. That was a crazy one. I believe that was Prohaska's UFC debut. But, um, you know, we've seen Vulcan cracked and hurt before, and I think that Ober can easily knock him out. I think either man could get knocked out. When you're talking about high-level strikers like this in the light heavyweight division, and you can argue that Ostomir is the more proven and more well-rounded fighter, but Carlos has shown a little, a little bit of development. He had a sub recently. I'm not saying that he would have an edge there, but really what I'm leaning on is the fact that the X factor of Carlos Olberg with his athleticism, his confidence, and just the speed he's going to have with the striking. We have a two inch, he'll have a two-inch reach advantage as well. I like Carlos Olberg. You guys know I've been kind of raving about him over the past couple of years, and I think that Olberg rises to the occasion kind of sets Ostemir back once again. And Olberg is a fighter that that realistically could be making a run at the title. I mean, we saw Khalil Roundtree just fight for the belt recently, which I don't think that he, uh, the vast majority of us thought that he should have never been in that spot. You get a fighter like Olberg, who's, who the UFC wants to give that opportunity to because he's already up there in age. He has the look. He's an exciting fighter. You can see Olberg maybe winning this fight, winning one more fight and fighting for the belt, depending on how things shake out. So, uh, give me Carlos Olberg to win this fight and to get a knockout. We may see back-to-back -back knockout victories in this light heavyweight division on the main card here. So the card will really be uh, revving its engines. And uh, if you're in the States, you better be up, you know, cooking your eggs and, and, and your bacon, have that coffee going. Of course, the fight's taking place early here uh, in the States. And uh, I will side with Carlos Olberg, who, let's take a look at this line. He opened up as a minus 265 on BetUS. It touched as high as a minus 280. It's starting to come back to earth a little bit, which was to be expected. Minus 250 line is, is a much more reasonable one than a minus 280. And I think that I think that this line should even be dipping down a little bit more so. I like Olberg a lot, but this line, I mean, I have this fight capped more around Olberg being a minus 220 favorite. I, I really like some of the intangibles that he brings into the cage, but you can't just overlook and disrespect Ostemir right now with the confidence that he's bringing into the cage with all the experience that he has. Uh, maybe even really, I have Olberg capped the more I think about it, like as a two to one favorite, a minus 200. I think anything higher than that, you're reaching. And I think the value is on Vulcan Ostemir, which you can get 
right around plus 210, plus 220, depending on uh, what, what line you could shop there. But the value is on the veteran, in my, in my opinion. And don't be surprised if this fight plays out in a variety of ways with just some craziness going on and either man getting knocked out. And the women's flyweight division, we got the Joker, Kong Wang. She's taking on Gabriela Fernandez. I think Gabriela Fernandez is being a little bit overlooked in this spot because of all the attention that, that Wang has brought into this fight based off her UFC debut. Uh, of course, knocking out Victoria Leonardo in spectacular fashion. I mean, the, the striking looked phenomenal. Beautiful one-two down the pipe, cracked her. And uh, there was a lot of buzz uh, on her coming into that that UFC debut uh, fight based on the fact that she's a fighter that has a victory over Valentina Shevchenko over in the kickboxing world. She's a high-level kickboxer. But let's be honest, she's very unproven as a, as a mixed martial artist, at least when it comes to her grappling and fighting high-level fighters. Uh, we, we, don't, we haven't seen a, a, a long history of a proven track record. Gabriela Fernandez, I think that she's a fighter that shows some promise. That She's a pretty good athlete. She has decent striking in her own right. But this is a tough matchup for her because she's a fighter that even though she has good striking, she's not getting any knockouts. She only has one knockout uh, throughout her entire career. And I don't think that she's going to outstrike Kong Wang. And she's not going to be able to win a decision there. So she's going to have to really land something big uh, to shake this fight up. And maybe she could get a knockout or, or, or drop Wang and kind of take control of this fight. Uh, maybe she could try to mix in some grappling and use, use some of her jujitsu. But nothing has really been uh, proven as far as that goes as well. Um, she, she actually lost her first two UFC fights fighting uh, fighters that use grappling to get the better of her and Teresa Bleda and Jasmine uh, just a divisius. So uh, she finally bounced back with the victory over Carly Judice, Judice, who is a good athlete, a young fighter that's starting to put it together. You can put a little bit of stock in that victory. But, uh, you know, I just want to make a point that Gabriela Fernandez shows promise. But, of course, I, I think you have to be on Kong Wang, and this is a good stylistic matchup for her. I'm excited for the the potential that Kong Wang will have moving forward in this division. She's just 32 years old. I really hope that she does put it all together and puts on uh, a lot more fun performances like that Leonardo fight where we're seeing her going out there and getting knockouts. You don't see that so much in women's MMA, and it's fun when you're watching that. So uh, I do like Kong Wang to win this fight. Take a look at the line for this fight because, once again, she's getting a lot of respect. She opened up as a minus 545. She's now a minus 1,000. And, uh, you know, you guys know what I'm going to say there. I don't mess with those kind of lines. I, I typically don't. Although, if you guys caught uh, my clean sweep for UFC 309, I did want to bring my Charles Oliveira tag down. And I did something I don't normally do. And I did throw a roofie in a two-team with him just to, to chalk that down a little bit. That's how confident I was in that 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 fight there. And uh, I think that this one's a little bit more of a risky one. But women's MMA and, and the fact that Wang is Kong Wang is a little bit more unproven long-term in MMA you just got to stay away from those those types of lines. So just uh, maybe you target a knockout. Even then, the line's going to be very high on those specific method of victories. This is one you probably got to sit back and just enjoy it. Get your your uh, Joker makeup, you know, out of your little your your bathroom mirror, dress up and uh, prance around your house and get excited uh, for the fight for all you Joker fans out there. In the welterweight division, we got two veteran strikers set to face off here: Song Kanan taking on Muslim Salikov. Salikov now forty years old and arguably should be coming into this fight on a three-fight losing streak. I thought that he did take an L against the crafty veteran in Santiago Ponzinibbio. Before that, took a loss to Randy Brown, where he was knocked out, if you guys remember that. Uh, then he also took an L to Nicholas Dalby there. And Salikov is a fighter that we've really seen take a, a step back uh, as far as his cardio and his output goes. It's to be expected. He's never He never was a fighter that really had uh, great output anyway. Wasn't really known for, for being a fighter that, that digs deep and pushes a crazy pace. He's more of a counter striker, a very slick striker. Uh, throws a lot of spinning attacks and whatnot. But the fact that he's 40 years old now, I mean, you, you really got to expect to see rapid decline in, in his game. Song Kanan is a fighter that's really not known for his cardio either. He's a fighter that uh, relies heavily on uh, knocking dudes out and using his striking. Very unreliable as far as his chin goes. You take a look at his eight losses. Half of them have come by way of knockout. Of course, the Max Griffin one was brutal, right? So he's not only just been finished in the feed. I mean, he's been brutally finished. We've seen him take a lot of serious damage. He followed up the Max Griffin KO loss with another KO loss against Ian Gary. Uh, we've seen him knocked out back in the day against fighters like Brad Riddell uh, and the former champ Israel Adesanya. Uh, but there are chin issues. There's no question about it. And that could be a little bit of a problem when you're facing off with the dude in Muslim Salikov, who, although if you take a look at 
some of his recent victories, you're not seeing a lot of knockout victories. Uh, there's, there's definitely a fair share of decision victories, but you have to understand he can crack. Uh, we saw that on display against Andre Fialo, who is a fighter that has his own chin issues, very similar to Song, but he capitalized on, in that fight, landing the knockout. Uh, but, but if you really want to see a highlight reel type of KO, go run the tape back on that Nordin Taleb fight. Uh, Nordin Taleb, the, the Canadian who came off the ultimate fighter, was a, a tough fighter there fighting out of TriStar, I believe, and he cracked him with a crazy shot in the first round. And uh, he's had his fair share of knockout victories before even joining the UFC. Uh, you, you think about when he defeated Melvin Gillard. Shout out to Melvin. Uh, Melvin used to be bouncing around the town, catching him at the uh, the old titty clubs back in the day in, uh, over in South Florida. But, you know, Muslim can crack. Uh, I'll, I'll warn you that. And even though he's 40 years old and he's not going to push a crazy pace, it only takes one one strike for him to shut Song Kanan's lights out. And Song is a fighter that, that the, he will be overly aggressive at times. And, and I do expect that if this fight goes to the judges' scorecards, I do expect that Song Kanan wins this fight. I'm just really concerned with Song running into a strike. So I've been back and forth with where I want to go for my decision here. Um, but but I got to stick. I got to stick to my guns here and I got to side with Muslim Salikov because I'm really concerned that Song is going to run into a, to a strike. Even when you look at some of his recent victories, right? Like if you look at the fight uh, where he had a victory over Ricky Glenn, he even got hurt in that fight, even though he he, he snuck it out and he won it. He got dropped in that fight. Uh, I mean, the, the chin issues are there. And Salikov, uh, I believe he's training in Denver for this fight. So maybe that helps the cardio a little bit, but he's a sniper. He's going to look to counter and I could see him hurting Song here. Now, if he doesn't land that knockout shot, you're going to have a tough road uh, to, to get a W because the crowd and the judges are going to be on Song's side. He's going to have the volume edge, and I could see him winning that decision easily there. Uh, but look at the number here. He, Song cannot absorbing 5.84 strikes per minute. I mean, the defense is bad, and Muslim is a sniper. He only, he's only been landing 3.32, very low output, but also only absorbing 2.92. He's hard to hit. We saw that in the Ponzinibbio fight. That was a close fight, and he was tough to, 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 touch, to touch up there. And uh, I'll side with the crafty veteran. If he comes in, Prepared and in shape, I, I think that this is Salikov's fight to uh to, to snatch here. So sorry to give you another favor, but I gotta stick to my guns here, man. I gotta really go off what I'm seeing with the tape here. And Muslim Salikov right now, he's a minus uh, 185. That's another line that may be a little bit too high for your liking. If he doesn't get that knockout, you're you're kind of banking on a knockout. And although I think that that's what we're gonna see, I think we're gonna see a knockout in this fight. I'm gonna say first or second round knockout for Muslim Salikov. But if you don't get that knockout, you're not going to be in a good situation. And you can argue that the value is, is most definitely on Song Kanan, which you can get a line on him as high as plus 155 at the hometown guy over there. And he's going to put that volume. And it's not out of the realm that he lands his own knockout. We talked about how Muslim Salikov was recently knocked out against Randy Brown. Song Kanan can crack as well. He's a knockout artist. So you got that going for you. But the most likely outcome is Muslim Salikov landing that counter KO. In the co-main event, we got some ranked Women's strawweight action between Yan Shonan, ranked number two in this division, coming off a title shot where she fell short against Wei Li Zhang. Uh, she's taking on Tabitha Ritchie, who's ranked number 10. Tabitha Ritchie, still under 30 years old, a stud athlete, uh, came into MMA with the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu base, but she's been working on her striking, of course. Uh, she's dating uh, the very high level boxer. Name slip in my mind right now, but you guys know I'm talking about the UFC's been pushing him. Uh, very, very much so, if you can comment his name, but a uh, talented young Irish boxer. So you can expect that uh, to translate and the, the continued growth into Richie striking. Uh, although I still will say that uh, Jan Shonan is going to be the more complete striker, the more dangerous striker. And I don't know if Richie wants to play that game too much. Uh, one thing I haven't liked for Richie is that uh, a lot of her fights play out closely. She's not a fighter that's really going out there and dominating. You see a lot of fights play out very closely, although it's against... Uh, solid competition. She's been in there with some, some solid competition. When you're looking at fighters like Jillian Robertson, Lupe Garines, Tisha Pennington, Angela Hill, those are respectable names. Uh, but I don't like the fact that they're playing out so closely because in a matchup like this against Jan Shonan, who lands very damaging strikes, she'll have that that edge if it goes to the judges' scorecards. Uh, th this could be a recipe for disaster uh, for Tisha Torres and, oh, excuse me, for Tabitha Ritchie. And Tabitha Ritchie, out of her 11 victories, she's only had three finishes, one knockout and two subs. And even though she's known for her jiu-jitsu, she's not really going out there subbing girls uh, that often in her MMA fights. So uh, you, you take note of that. Uh, and her two losses, we'll pull those two losses up real quick. 
Uh, she lost a split decision to Lupi Garines. That was a very close fight. And he, although once upon a time I was kind of high on Lupi, Lupi has been so up and down for, for me that I, I just don't even put that much stock into the level of competition uh, for Lupi either. I don't know. Lupi's been very flaky. Uh, and she was knocked out in her UFC debut against Manon Farot. Uh, and, and, you know, she was just very undersized in that fight. And Manon Farot is the real deal. So take that for what you will. But Jan Shonan is an absolute buzzsaw. I think she's going to be very hungry coming into this matchup after losing the, the, the last fight the way she did, coming up short uh, with an opportunity like that. She's taken her fair share of L's in the octagon, but always against high-level competition. Went to a split with Marina Rodriguez in a striking uh, type, type of affair. She got knocked out by Carla Esparza. That was the weird one. Okay, uh, she, she got caught there. I think she was worried about the takedown so much uh, that, that she did get hit with some big shots. But um, I mean, she's had her big victories, right? She, she definitely has uh, back in the day. Uh, most notably was the knockout over Jessica Andrade. That was really her coming out party. I think she's a good fighter. And um, I think she has a little bit left to offer the fight game. She'll have a two-inch reach advantage here. Uh, she, she's a larger frame. She's four inches taller. I think that Richie may struggle because I don't know if she's going to be able to continuously get this fight down to the mat. And even though her striking's developing, I think that Jan Shonan's going to get the better of those boxing exchanges. And she's going to get the lean when it goes to the judges' scorecard. So I like Jan Shonan to, to win this fight. I think that this is a, a great bounce back fight for her and she'll get a victory over a respectable name because Tabitha Ritchie's name does carry some weight. And uh, right now, Jan Shonan is a minus 190. That, that line's pretty accurate as far as I'm concerned. I think that she wins the fight and I think that that's an accurate line. If you want to be on her here, it's not too much of a reach. You don't want it to get out of hand, but under 200, anything under minus 200, it's not that much of a reach as far as I'm concerned. I, I like this spot for her. And that takes us to the main event, a fight that I'm very excited for. The number three ranked bantamweight, Piotr Jan, is taking on Devison Figueredo, who's ranked five already. He's 3-0 in this division since moving up. He's already ranked five. It's understandable, right? He's a former champ down in the flyweight division, and he's been looking pretty damn good. And he has some respectable victories already in this division, uh, defeating Marlon Chito Vera. That was an official play of ours. We cashed in there. Uh, the way he dominated Cody Garbrandt, got the sub down on the mat. That was impressive. Uh, and the way that he dominated Rob Font, too. I mean, you got to respect all of those victories. Uh, he seems to have a little bit more juice uh, in his tank when he's coming into these bantamweight fights. We know that he struggled a little bit with his weight cuts down in the flyweight division, some up and down performances uh, against Brand Brandon Moreno. But we saw Moreno in, in his last fight, man, another official play of mine that we cashed in on. But uh, Moreno still has a lot left to offer the fight game, and uh, Moreno is a good fighter. So take, take that for what you will. Uh, but what I'm more impressed with when you're talking about this matchup was the performance that Piotr Jan just had against Song Yudong. That was a very impressive performance by him. I think he just uh, brought his career back to life. He, this is going to be the start of a resurgence for him, especially when you take into consideration the way his career was playing out over the, the couple of years before that. You know, just to quickly run you through it. I mean, he was an absolute fire when he, when he was finishing fighters like Uriah Faber and Jose Aldo. And, you know, the Aljamain Sterling fight, the first time around, he was dominating him. And Aljamain Sterling took the chicken chickens route out. Okay, guys, I can go uh, on a tear talking about that situation. It cost me some big money. Uh, I didn't lose the money, but, you know, obviously that was a win that was already in our pocket. I had some big money tied up in that fight. And you guys know what Sterling did. A lot of you guys were in denial. Sterling could have continued. And I know some of you guys like to go to the point, oh, look at you sitting in your chair, you know, uh, you know, Monday quarterbacking what these fighters sh should do. Let's see if you were in a fight, whatever, this and that. It's not about that. It's about the fact that Sterling is a UFC fighter that's supposed to be in there uh, being a warrior and doing the right thing. And he definitely could have fought. And if you guys, I mean, do I need to continue going on about that? You guys remember what happened. Sterling was, uh, you, you saw it in his eyes and he was looking around and he, he knew he was getting dominated. Anyways, after that, looked good against Corey Sanhagen. And then he had the rematch with Aljamain Sterling. I had him winning that fight three to two. Uh, and Sterling had success taking his back and then boringly stifling him with some grappling. I was there for the fight, took place in Jacksonville. That was very frustrating. The whole crowd was in shock. We couldn't believe the way that the judges went there. The Sean O'Malley fight, the vast majority of us had him winning that fight. Check the major media scores. He should have won that fight as well. That was very strange. Sean O'Malley had a success countering and whatnot too, but that, that just he mixed it up very well in that fight. He should have won that fight. The weird thing was the performance against Marab, and that's the fight that he needs to look back to when he's looking to, to, to resurge himself and take himself to the next level if he wants to hold that gold. Of course, Marab's the champion. He was ragdolled by Marab, but I love the way that he looked in that song fight, stuffing takedowns, using his striking. I think that he's really grinding 
with his grappling, knowing what he needs to do to go out there and get revenge against Marab. Piotr Jan's an absolute competitor. He knows what he needs to do. I think he's grinding with his grappling right now. He's still only 31 years old. He has a lot left to offer the fight game. Devison Figueredo is an explosive one type, one pop type of striker, uh, but he really relies on his grappling, really. That's where we've been seeing Figueredo have the, the majority of his success, bullying guys, taking them down, taking guys that are even bigger than him, getting them down to the mat and using his jiu-jitsu. I don't think that Figueredo is going to be able to hang with Jan tit for tat on the feet. I think that Jan mixes it up way too well. He'll be switching stances. He'll out-volume Figueredo. I think Piotr Jan's going to stuff the takedown attempts from Figueredo, especially when you take into consideration this is a five-round fight. Piotr Jan's going to have so much time to just compute everything Figueredo's bringing his way. So even if Figueredo has one round where he gets him down and has a little bit of success there, we saw in Piotr Jan's last fight, uh, I believe it was, yeah, the last fight against Song, is he started to get better as the fight went on. His cardio is looking really good. This is a, a perfect matchup for him to get another W and make his run towards uh, potentially becoming the champion of this division once again, which is a steep statement when you have the champion uh, Marab there who dominated him. But do not underestimate this, this fighter, Piotr Jan. I know I won't. After what I've seen from him, I, I really see something buzzing with him right now. And uh, this is going to be a coming out party for him as far as I'm concerned. I think Piotr Jan is going to look really good here. And I think that he's going to get a TKO stoppage. I think Figueredo is going to kind of fizzle out. It might not be brutal, but I think Figueredo kind of squeals his way out from making it to the final bell and Piotr Jan volumes him and gets a stoppage in, in kind of a weirder way. Um, maybe similar to what we saw in one of those Moreno fights with Figueredo where, where he just didn't seem like he was uh, on his P's and Q's. He didn't seem like he was mentally there. Piotr Jan finds a finish within 25 minutes and uh, Piotr Jan's a minus 310 right now. It's, it opened up as a minus 270. He did touch 360, so it came all the way back on uh, BetUS. And, and I understand why that line is like that. I really do. I think stylistically, this is a really good matchup for him. He should be around a three to one favorite here. So it's not that much of a reach. This is uh, Piotr Jan's time to, to make a run at this once again. All right, guys, that's going to wrap this one up. Remember, this is an early start time. If you're in the States, you pretty much got to pull off your, your English MMA fan type of tactic and maybe just stay up all throughout the night and work your way from the nice cold brew right to your... Uh, what are they eating for breakfast over there in England? Come on, I got a couple English followers. What are you guys eating? Uh, what do they call it? Uh, chipping, chips and gravy. No, what are you guys eating? Fish and chips. Having fish and chips and some, uh, some beans with your eggs in the morning. Get that complete English breakfast going. Maybe we'll stay up throughout the whole night. And uh, I know I'll, I'll be up for the first fight. I, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but um, I'll be up and I will watch all these fights. There's no question about it. You guys know how we do it. Us real fight fans uh, will be excited for this, this card. And we'll make this another profitable event, which... It's going to be crazy. I know I got some spots for this card. If you want to work with me, reach out to me. We've been on absolute fire. I'm going to make this one another profitable one. I hope you guys all do too. Remember to look yourself in the mirror. Remind yourself that you're the man. Feel good about yourself and appreciate your health because, you know, any at any time, man, something can, can go wrong. I'll tell you guys a quick little story. And this is just one of those things to put things into perspective. You know, I was grabbing a bite to eat uh, not too long ago. I was eating out and there was something sharp in one of my, it's kind of a long story, but I was eating and I should have caught it before I swallowed it, but I felt a little something and I tried to swallow it down because I was kind of caught up with some, uh, a pretty big situation that was going on. I don't really want to get into all that, but something was going on and I kind of was distracted and I, and I felt something and I just thought it was whatever. Maybe it was like a piece of the rib, uh, like the crispy part and I tried to swallow it down. I think it was a bristle from the the grill, the the brush grill or something sharp. Something something got me good, man. It hurt. It, was, it freaked me out, man. It was trapped in my uh, my throat. And then for the next couple of days, I'm feeling this pain there and I'm thinking, is something stuck in there? And it was stressful, man. But I think I cut myself uh, from swallowing whatever the hell that was. And, you know, just in a blink of an eye, man, something could happen where you're just on, you know, you're, you're feeling great. Everything's going good. And then next thing you know, you got a lot of stress and that's how life is, man. There's a lot worse things than that. People are going through worse things. Just when things are going smooth, when you got that smooth sailing, you need to stop and appreciate it. That's what I want to say. Appreciate it. Because if you don't, you take it for granted. Some of you guys are sitting around right now and everything is completely smooth sailing. Some of you guys are probably living at home with your parents still. Got hot meals waiting for you on the table and all that. And you guys still think you got some, some you got something tough going on. And as you get older, that's when you really understand and appreciate times like that. So if you can take a word of advice from an older fellow over here, you, know, you guys see the grays coming in and I got a little wisdom to give to you young bucks. Appreciate the smooth times, because it ain't going to always be smooth. I promise you that. All right, guys. Signing out. Teller. The Teller. The Teller. The Teller.